Hello. What I'd like to do today is set the stage for this roundtable by giving an overview of what the most common molecular targets for anti-epileptic drugs are and give some sense for the different places that our commonly used drugs work. Leading, uh, that will lead into then a discussion of talking about newer um, molecular entries, newer drugs, and then finishing up with a discussion of how these mechanisms may all fit together and how we may potentially combine drugs uh, to get an enhanced effect. First, let me start with a very sort of global uh, picture of what we think is going on with seizures and with epilepsy. From a very simplistic point of view, we think that there is an imbalance between excitatory transmission in the brain and inhibitory transmission in the brain. The primary excitatory neurotransmitters in the brain are glutamate and aspartate, and the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain is GABA. So what we think may potentially be occurring in a patient having seizures is that there is a dramatic imbalance. There may be a relative excess of excitatory neurotransmission, probably by glutamate mechanisms, and we'll talk about some of the receptors involved here in a moment, or a relative um, failure of inhibitory neurotransmission, either an absolute lack or deficiency of GABA or a relative insensitivity of different receptors. In any event, our goal with anti-epileptic drug therapy is to try to somehow bring these forces back into balance or modulate these various, various neurotransmitter systems. So when we look at the factors that seems to govern neuronal excitability, I've already alluded to a number of potential targets, and we'll refine this as we go on today. We, there is either exci enhanced excitation, there is either a, perhaps an alteration in um, action potential currents in neurons mediated by calcium or sodium. Again, reduced inhibition through some alteration of the GABA system. Potassium currents. Potassium currents are important for uh, maintaining membrane hyperpolarization, and it's a relatively newer target for anti-epileptic drug therapy. Or there may be changes in extracellular um, ionic fields, either potassium or calcium. But what we're going to try to do today is focus on the major uh, targets. So if we refine this a bit more, if we talk about trying to bring these excitatory inhibitory forces back into balance, we can look at, take a lesson and look at how our current anti-epileptic drugs work. And in fact, our current anti-epileptic drugs, many of them have multiple mechanisms of action. But we can sort this out either by drugs that work at modulating, modulating or stabilizing sodium channels, calcium channels, potassium channels, or work on GABA receptors or GABA concentrations within the synapse. What's important to know that every anti-epileptic drug seems to have a distinct pattern or spectrum of mechanisms of action. Now, to rephrase this a little bit and to show this pictorially, if we look at a synapse, we have inhibitory a synapse and excitatory synapse. And again, the major inhibitory targets would be modulation of GABA. And there's a number of mechanisms by which we can do that. And we'll discuss this in a few minutes um, to some greater detail. Conversely, perhaps the mo one of the more productive areas for anti-epileptic drug research over the last years has been in modulating um, action potential currents, modulating ionic currents and excitatory neurons. And that's principally done through modulation of sodium channels and calcium channels, and more recently, a look at potassium channels. Now, taking that same cartoon and now putting over it, where do our major drugs work? And again, when we look at the traditional anti-epileptic drugs that we have available to us, older generation medicines such as phenytoin, carbamazepine, as well as some of our more recent uh, anti-epileptic drugs, such as lamotrigine and zonisamide, for example, work at modulation through sodium channels. And we'll discuss that in a bit more detail because there's been important advances in our understanding of sodium channels, and it's led to the development of newer molecules. Again, on the inhibitory side, our major drugs that work at modulation of uh, inhibitory neurotransmission or GABA transmission have either been the benzodiazepines or the barbiturates. 
But in, for, in some respects, new, other newer molecules, such as perhaps felbamate and topiramate, also work by modulation in some regard of GABA transmission. So what I'd like to talk now is a little bit more depth about sodium channels, being that this is perhaps the most common mechanism by which many of our anti-epileptic drugs work. Recall that the sodium channels um, typically exist in a resting state on neurons. Following an action potential, or there is depolarization. This causes the sodium channel to open up, allowing sodium ions to rush in. This is how action potentials are propagated in neurons. Now, within milliseconds of this happening, sodium channels become inactivated. There's a period of time that repolarization takes place, and then the cycle repeats, where the channel goes back into the resting state and is able to be stimulated again. Now, there's another step that we need to acknowledge, and that's the slow inactivation step. Now, fast inactivation takes place over milliseconds. And this is indeed where most of our commonly used older generation antiepileptic drugs work. Things such as carbamazepine, phenytoin, lamotrigine, for example, work by enhancing the time that the sodium channel is inactivated in the fast inactivated state. But what we've come to recognize is that there is a slow inactivation step to sodium channels, where the sodium channel actually changes its conformation. This is very important. This is perhaps important for the long-term stabilization of these neurons and effectively slow inactivation in a situation where a neuron is being repetitively stimulated may actually take that channel out of the excitatory pool as it were. This may be in a very important mechanism, and Dr. Wesher will be discussing this in greater detail. The slow inactivation step, unlike fast inactivation, takes place over, over seconds. So again, talking about on the sodium channel where our specific drugs work, there are drugs that work to block the open state of the uh, sodium channel. Classical drugs such as the local anesthetic, such as lidocaine, in theory lidocaine should work, but again, because of its toxicity, would not be considered a traditional anti-epileptic drug. As I mentioned, our classical prototypical anti-epileptic drugs, carbamazepine, phenytoin, lamotrigine, work by enhancing that fast inactivation step. And this is a very viable and productive molecular target, a mechanism for anti-epileptic drugs. And again, uniquely, we have newer molecules that we'll be discussing later on, glucosamide, that works and is the only of our current anti-epileptic drugs that works by enhancing that slow inactivation step. Again, these are very, very distinct st um, molecular targets and very distinct electrophysiologic effects. Now, I'd like to return to this slide. And we've, we've discussed um, previously the notion of blockade of voltage-gated sodium channels and calcium channels to uh, limit repetitive firing of neurons and decrease excitability. Now, for a moment, I want to talk about the postsynaptic side of this, of, excit of excitability. And what you can see on this cartoon are the excitatory um, NMDA receptors and the AMPA kinate receptors. These are important in governing um, excitability following an action potential. Now, currently, we really don't have marketed drugs that work directly on either the NMDA or the AMPA site. We do have drugs that partially work to modulate these postsynaptic excitatory receptors. For example, felbamate can work to partially modulate the NMDA receptor, and topiramate can work to partially modulate the kinate, AMPA kinate receptor. These are going to be important molecular targets in the future. As Dr. Wester will be discussing, a newer molecule, parampanil, seems to have a specific mechanism of action working at the AMPA receptor site and may prove to be a valuable addition to our epilepsy armamentarium. I want to move now and talk about calcium channel modulation or blockade. Calcium channels um, are very important in governing excitability. Um, T-type calcium channel modulation may be very important in certain um, epilepsies such as um, absence seizures. This seems to be a hypersynchronization 
at the thalmocortical level. Classic drugs uh, such as ethosuximide work by modulating this calcium channel. But a class of drugs that I want to spend a couple minutes talking about are the gabapentinoids, specifically gabapentin and more recently pregabalin. These drugs were originally synthesized to be analogs of the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA. I think it's important to realize that th these drugs don't work on the GABA system. In fact, what we have learned about the gabapentinoid molecules is they have very complex pharmacology. They bind to a specific subunit of the presynaptic a calcium channel and govern calcium entry into um, overly excitable cells. There may be other targets besides this calcium channel modulation that may involve um, modulation of calcium transport within the cell and packaging and release of neurotransmitters from the cell. Now, gabapentinoids have proven to be very, very valuable anti-epileptic drugs, and they have a host of other potential pharmacologic actions as well. Now, we've discussed the excitatory side of the equation, talking about uh, targets on sodium and calcium channels that may govern excitability. I'd like to turn now and talk about the inhibitory side of the equation, and specifically I'd like to talk about GABA modulation. As I mentioned, GABA is the principal inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. So by enhancing GABA effects, either by augmenting GABA or by increasing the absolute concentration of GABA in the synapse, we can reasonably expect anti-seizure effects. And indeed, we have several examples of drugs that do just that. Looking at this cartoon, you can see the GABA-A receptor. We have drugs that work directly to stimulate the GABA-A receptor, um, allowing more chloride to go into the cell and make it more hyperpolarized. An example of that would be drugs such as the barbiturates, phenobarbital. We have other GABA augmenting drugs, such as the benzodiazepines, that work in concert with GABA and enhance, again, the activity of GABA at a postsynaptic level. But there are other potential targets. Tiagabine. Tiagabine is a unique molecule that blocks the synaptic reuptake of GABA, therefore allowing more GABA to be available in the synapse and potentially allowing a spillover of GABA outside the synapse, which may or may not have um, beneficial effects. Now, another pathway, a more recent pathway that's been identified as a molecular target is inhibition of the breakdown of GABA. A drug that will be discussed in more detail in Dr. Wesher's presentation is Vigabatrin. Vigabatrin works as an irreversible inhibitor of the enzyme GABA transaminase, and this is an enzyme that's responsible for the metabolism of GABA. Again, what Vigabatrin does is increases absolute synaptic concentrations of GABA. This is a unique molecule that it's irreversible, and its time course of its activity, its pharmacodynamic effect, is very independent of its pharmacokinetic effect, which is far shorter. Now, moving on from GABAergic transmission, I'd like to talk about one final unique molecular target, and that involves um, proteins, presynaptic proteins that may be involved in the packaging of and transmission of excitatory neurotransmitters. The drug I'm talking about is levetiracetam. Levetiracetam binds to a unique presynaptic protein called SV2A, or synaptic vesicle 2A. Now, levetiracetam is very unique in that in traditional models of, seizure active, of seizures, levetiracetam appeared not to work. Levetiracetam was unique in that it showed activity in other chronic models of seizure disorders. We know now that levetiracetam appears to have a very unique mechanism of action, a very specific mechanism of action, again, binding to this synaptic vesicle 2A. What the precise role of the synaptic vesicle is in seizure generation and propagation is still somewhat unclear. But what is interesting is that we know that with the potency of and specificity of binding to this particular protein, we can enhance 
seizure activ anti seizure activity. And that's demonstrated with this slide that if we look in an animal model of audiogenic seizures, that with increased binding of to SV2A, we get increased anti seizure activity. Again, this is going to be potentially a very useful molecular target as we go on to develop newer mo molecules for treatment of epilepsy. In conclusion, it would be overly simplistic to say that there is one mechanism of action for any given anti-epileptic drug. What we've seen for many of our older anti-epileptic drugs, they may have multiple mechanisms of action. Which mechanisms of action are most important in any given seizure type? We don't have the data to tell us that at the moment. I think going forward, it's going to be important for us when we begin discussing rational polytherapy or rational combinations of drugs to recognize that there may be multiple molecular targets in individual patients that may be valuable for us to exploit. Thank you.